Welcome, you guys, to May 2021 Taco Tuesday, which is our family resource night at the Washington State School for the Blind. And tonight we have Jerry Clark as our guest speaker, who is a parent resource coordinator from the Washington PAVE program. And so she's going to talk all about what that is. And um, let's get started. Jerry, hold on, let me make you host and then you can share. Let's go. Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for taking time this evening to come out and learn about family advocacy and student rights. So my name is Jerry Clark. I am a family resource coordinator for Washington PAVE. Let's see. PAVE has been around since the end of the 1970s as a nonprofit organization that helps families navigate systems that are related to all manner of disabilities. Our parent training and information program is funded through the US Department of Education to help families specifically navigate the school based services. So we do a lot of work to help families understand rights and responsibilities in the IEP process, Section 504 and all of the things that we're going to talk about in this evening's training. We are a statewide agency, so we serve families all over Washington State if they have individual questions for us through technical assistance calls that we can do by phone or Zoom, sometimes in person. And uh, we also provide resources and information through our website. So a great way for families to reach out for our one-to-one -one help is by going to our website, which is w-a-p-a-v-e dot org, that's as in wapave.org, and clicking get help on our homepage. And from there, you can navigate through a helpline request form and let us know what sort of help you're looking for. We do on our website have a statement of solidarity for the Black Lives Matter movement. And we just want to call out that we hear and see individuals who have experienced discrimination based on race. And we stand with individuals in anti-discriminatory policies. So tonight's training is focused on protections for students with disabilities some vocabulary around special education process, some tips for family advocates, because my understanding is that those of you who are here this evening are advocates in your families, a little bit more information about seeking our services and some additional resources. So I just wanna start out by saying that no student rights at the state or national level were waived in light of the COVID pandemic. So the student rights that we'll be discussing this evening are the same as they always have been. And those rights have not been altered. Some educational services are being delivered differently in light of the pandemic, but none of the student rights were rewritten or altered. It's important for families to understand that they have rights to information about their child's education in a language that is understandable to them. That includes sign language or any um, language other than English that a family might need in order to participate fully in their student's education. So the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, which is the guidance agency for Washington State, does provide information about parent language access rights on its website. I do want to note that I'll be providing Diet with a copy of my PowerPoint. So wherever you see a hyperlink in the PowerPoint, you'll have access to those links through the PowerPoint when you receive a copy. 
So this is a, a page from our website, and I want to point out that we have a search bar where you can search for topics of interest to you. And we have something called Toolkit Basics, where to begin when a student needs more help. So if you went to our website and you typed Toolkit in the search bar, you would get access to a preliminary article. And that article is just loaded with other resource links that include a lot of the information that I'm gonna share with you this evening. So for example, if you remember learning some vocabulary from me, but you can't quite remember what it was that you wanted to remember, this toolkit is a good place to go for some of that foundational information. So I want to start by talking about where student rights live. And this pyramid gives you a visual for understanding that student rights are on a bit of a continuum. So at the base of the pyramid is ESSA, which is the Every Student Succeeds Act. This is a law that protects all children in the United States in their right to access free public education that is designed to ensure that every child can achieve. In the middle of the pyramid are two civil rights laws. Section 504 is part of a law called the Rehabilitation Act. It was passed in 1973, and it mirrors in a lot of ways some aspects of the Americans with Disabilities Act, both of these laws guarantee non-discriminatory rights to individuals with disabilities throughout their lifespan. Non-discriminatory means equity. So what productivity enhancers or accommodations are necessary in order for the individual with a disability circumstance to access what everyone else has the access to. So equity doesn't mean equal, it means support in order to equitably access what is publicly available. At the top of the pyramid is the IDEA, which is the grant entitlement program that allows for individualized programming for students with disabilities from age three through 21, or when they graduate from high school. So students who are eligible for the protections of IDEA have a right to an education that is appropriately designed just for them. Take note that students who are eligible at the top of this pyramid have all of these rights. So sometimes schools will talk about whether a student has a 504 plan or an IEP. Take note that if a student has an IEP, they also have all of the protections of Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. So those rights to equity are in place for all students with disabilities. So at the top, you have a uniquely designed appropriate program. In the middle, you have the right to equity. And at the base is the right to access that is afforded to all children. So in making the transition from early learning, because I know some of you have little ones, into IEP services, that's when uh, IDEA's Part C provisions transition to the Part B provisions. So Part, Part C provides for those early learning individualized family services plan uh, programs for the birth to three, and then IDEA Part B provides for IEP services delivered through school-based special education services. So that transition requires an evaluation done by the school district, and IEP eligibility is a little bit different. The criteria are different than the criteria for those early learning services. So we're going to focus today on IEP services and eligibility. 
So here are just some key points, some high level concepts to understand as family advocates. Special education services are built and delivered based on the needs of the student. And that sounds sort of obvious until you start to realize that sometimes we as families want to ask, well, what programs does the school have that might meet my student's needs? And it's an upside down question. The question to ask is, what does the student need based on their unique individual circumstances? So everything about this process is needs-based and student-centered. Also important to note that special education is a service, not a place. At no point did the federal uh, regulations indicate that students who need special education services should always start by going down the hall to that one specific classroom. That's not the intent. And we'll talk a little bit more about placement later in today's talk. But keep in mind, special education services are delivered to meet a student's needs. Also, education is not just academics. Services are designed to provide equitable access to all aspects of learning in school. And right now, a really big topic around that has to do with special education services. Um, Diet, real quick, somebody wants in. Should I just let them in and assume they're okay? Done. So when talking about IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, it's really helpful to understand the primary principles of this federal grant entitlement program. And each of these we're going to talk about a little bit more as I move on through the presentation, but I'm just going to touch on them now and help you see them as a unit as six primary principles. The first and most important overarching principle is that a student who is eligible for special education services is entitled to a free, appropriate public education. So remember in that pyramid we looked at, the word appropriate was at the top. So what makes the learning opportunities appropriate in light of that student's unique circumstances? creates this individual entitlement to FAPE. We'll talk about that throughout tonight's conversation. If you only learn one thing tonight, it might you might want it to be FAPE. Free appropriate public education is the right of a student with disabilities. The second principle has to do with the right to a non-discriminatory evaluation services for eligible students are delivered through an individualized education program that's the iep the right to fape in the least restrictive environment to the maximum extent appropriate is a founding primary principle of idea <clears throat> so we'll talk a little bit more about placement Parents and students are granted the right to participate in this decision-making team-led process. <coughs> Pardon me. And families have rights in this process. And the process is described quite explicitly under IDEA. The procedures of special education are really written down in a very clear way and schools are responsible to follow those procedures. So the student and family learn about their rights through a document called procedural safeguards. FAPE, free appropriate public education. If we were in person, I would make you say that out loud so you could say it inside your own heads. This is the entitlement of a student who is eligible for services. No disability circumstance is too difficult and a student's entitlement to FAPE is not dependent on the nature or the severity of their disability. All students have the right to a free appropriate public education that is designed uniquely for them. 
What does FAPE promise? Well, over the years since this uh, law was established, there have been a number of court cases that have further defined what FAPE means. And a really important one happened in the Supreme Court in 2017, when the court said that in order to meet its responsibility to FAPE, a school district is responsible to provide an IEP that is reasonably calculated to enable a child to make progress appropriate in light of the child's circumstances. So this is a really good overarching vantage point to come at the IEP process. Is this IEP reasonably calculated to enable appropriate progress, meaningful progress? So if you look back at where we've been so far this evening, here are some key questions for family advocates. Remember at the base of that pyramid was the right to access public education. So we can ask, is this student's learning accessible? And then we had in the middle of the pyramid, these civil rights laws, section 504 and the ADA that provide for equity. So are the students' learning opportunities equitable? Do they have the productivity enhancers that they need to access with equity what everyone else can access without those supports? And then thirdly, at the top of the pyramid again is the IDEA. So is this IEP designed to enable progress that's appropriate in light of the child's circumstances? So here's a visual to go with those three questions. When you come to meet with the school, if you imagine that maybe you're two mountains and you have very different views on certain aspects of this educational program, but can you come down to where the two mountains intersect at the base and consider that FAPE is the common ground. Everyone at the table wants FAPE for this student, wants the student to, access in an equitable way that appropriate educational program. So if you can start at the base where the student's right to FAPE lives, sometimes it can really help you find common ground in your collaborative conversations with the school. So every other principal Remember, FAPE was the first of six. All the other principles have an aspect of FAPE to them. So the right to FAPE includes the right to a non-discriminatory evaluation. IDEA includes a very specific mandate called Child Find, which gives a school district the affirmative duty to seek out, evaluate, and potentially serve infants, toddlers, or school-age students who have a known or suspected disability if there is a reasonable suspicion that the disability condition could significantly be impacting that student's access to learning and education. So that's all that Child Find requires. So if there is reasonable suspicion of a disability impacting access to learning under child find, the school district is responsible to evaluate that student in a non-discriminatory way. Evaluation is a three-part process. So once eligibility is being considered and an evaluation is underway, Families want to make sure that it's a comprehensive evaluation that's looking at all possible areas of impact to ask these three questions. Is there indeed a disability circumstance? Second, does the disability create an adverse educational impact? And third, does the student require specially designed instruction and or related services in order to access FAPE? If the answer to all three questions is yes, in any given area of learning, then the student can be found eligible for IEP services. So here's some questions for family advocates to ask in that evaluation process. 
what will the school district's evaluation look for? Who is doing the evaluation and what credentials are necessary to collect and assess the data? And how do we ensure that specialists are part of data collection and interpretation? So for example, if a student is blind or visually impaired, is an expert, for example, a teacher of the visually impaired involved in that evaluation process. So you're getting high level data and information about what's truly going on with the student and the nature of their specific disability. So these are the IEP of eligibility categories. The first 13 on this list are federal categories of disability. The very last one at the bottom, developmental delay, is actually a category determined state by state. And in Washington, developmental delay can make a student eligible for early learning services, birth to three, and IEP services. Right here on my slide, it says through age nine, but uh, the OSPI is currently considering a change to the regulations that's actually going to make that uh, birth to 10. So we can stay tuned for that change probably coming this spring. But the other nine, uh, the other 13 categories of eligibility last until the student either graduates from high school or ages out of services at 21. So the way that FAPE is delivered is through the Individualized Education Program, the IEP. Important aspect of the IEP is the present levels of performance. And this is where whatever was discovered through evaluation gets recorded and interpreted to determine what specially designed instruction is necessary for the student to access the learning. So present levels of academic achievement and functional performance or PLOP for short um, can be amended to include information from the family. So family advocates wanna read that section really carefully and make sure that it is an accurate, accurate depiction of the student's current level of success and struggle because that determines the areas for specially designed instruction and related services that the student is going to receive. And then those services are progress measured through goal setting. So each area of specially designed instruction is going to include at least one goal. And you want to see how the student is doing by measuring progress toward that goal. So remember, FAPE is an IEP reasonably calculated to enable progress appropriate in light of the circumstances. This is where progress is measured. So this is how you'll know whether the student is making meaningful, adequate, appropriate progress in their learning. So a rubric that you can use to look at the IEP and understand what you're seeing is SMART. Are the goals specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and they're always going to be annual goals, but you want to make sure that that time frame makes sense for the goal that you're talking about. So uh, when blindness or low vision is an aspect of a student's program, there's an expanded core curriculum that is important to know about when you're looking at what are the services, what are the goals, what is the student looking at, or what is the student focusing on learning in terms of skills. So these are some examples from the expanded core curriculum using Braille to read and write, navigating through orientation and mobility, using specialized technology devices and making sure everyone working with that student knows how to use that assistive technology. Um, and also learning to use existing vision effectively and efficiently. Um, you wanna make sure that that's part of the program and that families aren't just told, well, she can see, 
So we don't have to work on vision, right? She can see if she tries hard enough. That's not acknowledging the disability circumstances of this unique student. And, and Jerry, can I interject here just Please. a tiny, tiny bit? not just vision, but all sensory modalities. So the sense of touch, the sense of smell, the sense of hearing, all of those senses, because they also, those could be learning channels for children and in addition to vision. So it's really all of the senses. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So here's some additional IEP questions that might be relevant for family advocates to consider. So what goals is the student working on? Are the present levels accurate and up to date? How is progress being measured? Is there a way that the family might support the progress? And what is a plan for the school and family to regularly communicate, to check in about that progress and any adjustments that might need to be made? You wouldn't want to go a whole year and then realize no progress had been made toward a goal. You want to be watching it all along. So ancillary or related services are an aspect of the IEP for students who need specific therapies in order to support their learning. So for example, orientation and mobility, occupational, physical, or speech therapy, nursing services. Another set of examples includes parent training. So for example, if behavior is an aspect of a student's program, training parents in using the same positive behavioral supports might be an aspect of the IEP. Sometimes staff need training. For example, if an occupational therapist is providing a service related to how the student is using a certain technology, even as simple as how they hold their pencil, Training other staff in helping support that student's work can also be part of related services. Um, to, you know, important to note that related services through an IEP at the public school can be provided even if the student isn't receiving academic education through the public school system. So a student can be evaluated by the public district and receive IEP services, IEP related services, even if they're homeschooled or in a private school type of a setting. This is from OSPI's website. It's a sample grid of what staff would be working from as they're building the service matrix. But it's important to note that when you're looking at the IEP, the service matrix page is a grid. And it's going to include all of this detail about what the service is, the frequency, the location, who's responsible, um, so that you really look at, so what's being worked on during those service minutes does the amount of time make sense for the services that are being delivered and the learning that the student is trying to build on? Um, and so there's going to be a section in the matrix for uh, specially designed instruction and a section for those related services. Another part of the IEP to note is the section that lists accommodations, modifications, and any assistive technologies. So I have a purple arrow pointing to this OSPI um, model form where it says other. And I just want to call out that it was never intended for an IEP accommodations page to be a cut and paste project. These accommodations are individually designed. Yes, there are some suggestions that might help a team develop a program, but this box that says other is the most important box. Given what we know about the student, what do they need? Yeah, and Jerry, in my experience as a teacher, that other box is just not big enough. They can make it as big as it needs to be. Yeah. Copy and paste that other, right? <laughs> Thank you, Diet. So uh, we mentioned this earlier, we're gonna circle back to placement. So a student is entitled to FAPE, 
free appropriate public education in the least restrictive environment to the maximum extent appropriate. That means a student goes to general education classroom in their local public school with their same age, typically developing peers, unless they absolutely cannot receive FAPE in that setting. FAPE includes all of the supplementary aids and supports that that student might need in order to access that least restrictive environment. So here's some language, and when you get a copy of the PowerPoint, this link will take you directly to the federal regulations that are part of IDEA. But schools must ensure that to the maximum extent appropriate, children with disabilities, including children in public or private institutions or other facilities, are educated with children who are non-disabled and any special classes, separate schooling or removal of children from the regular classroom occurs only if the nature or severity of the disability is such that education in regular classes with the use of supplementary aids and services cannot be achieved satisfactorily. In other words, if the student is unable to access FAPE, even with all of the clever creative help that we can think of to provide, then the IEP team starts to talk about alternative placements. Special education is a service, not a place. And PAVE provides an article about least restrictive environment with that as its title. We have a couple of articles on our website and these are links to those articles. So parent and student participation is also a guaranteed aspect of FAPE for a student who's eligible for services. And here is the Washington Administrative Code where information about parent participation lives. So all of the special education regulations in Washington are part of the Washington Administrative Code or we call them the WACS 392-172A. This particular WAC ends with the numbers 03100, and that's where the parent and student rights to participate in IEP process live. In order to help families participate in advocacy for their students, PAVE provides a sample handout form that parents, if they wanted to, can use to prepare a document for a team meeting. And this form, I've got two slides because the form is uh, up and down and my slides are across, <laughs> but uh, this is the top half uh, of the form. <clears throat> and it kind of walks you through itself in terms of questions that you might consider in terms of how to create a unique document for your student. Um, on our website, we have an article that's called Get Ready for Your Meeting with a handout for the team that includes this sample form and some information and instructions about how a family member might use it if they want to. You could also just use it as a suggestion if you have your own ideas about how to get ready for a meeting. But I will say it's quite profound when you go to an in-person meeting, for example, and there are 12 copies of this document laid out across the table with a student's picture in the middle and everyone has a clear visual on who the most important person in the room is. Um, on Zoom, it's been kind of cool because if families create this handout, then it gets pulled up and shared just like I'm sharing these slides this evening. And then the student's face is right there in everyone's screen. So it is a great way to remind everyone that this is the little person that we're here to talk about today and their needs are our priority. So these are the questions that are suggested at the bottom of that form, um, just to help families kind of brainstorm about what are my topics of concern? Is there a need that's not being met? Are we having a communication challenge? Is there something about the IEP that we'd like to change or a goal that isn't being met? 
Um, is there something that's working well and we need to really dive into that and build it out um, for some other elements that maybe aren't going so well? Um, and then if there's anything else um, that a family wants to bring forward in the meeting, if you do these handouts before your meetings and you send them to the school ahead of time, you can actually really have a lot to do with the agenda that gets built for that meeting. So the sixth and final principle of IDEA is the procedural safeguards. So again, this is a booklet that describes the family's rights and the specific processes. So for example, Washington State's procedural safeguards have very specific deadlines related to evaluation process. Those are listed in the procedural safeguards. The best place to get a copy if you don't have one from the school, you can always ask the school for a copy. But another place to get one is to go to the Office of Superintendent of Public Education website. And all you would need to do is just type in your browser OSPI procedural safeguards and this page would come up for you. And then you can print a copy or you can just read it off of your screen. I encourage all families to revisit their procedural safeguards regularly and you'll layer on the learning. It can feel really technical in the beginning, but as you start to become more familiar with the language of special education, you'll learn in layers. So some additional support for families, the Department of Services for the Blind provides some youth services. They have pre-employment pre-employment transition services for uh, young people starting at age 14 if the student has a transition plan already in their IEP by that age. Um, they have some voc rehab. They have a business enterprise program to help adults kind of move into managerial positions in the working world if they are uh, visually impaired. Um, and then DSB also has a mobility uh, training center and some independent living skills programs that they provide. Um, the Developmental Disabilities Administration is a separate agency from DSB in Washington, um, and they also have some information about vocational rehabilitation, school to work programs. So sometimes families overlap these two agencies and you can actually reach out to both. Um, we do on our website have some articles about early intervention services and that transition from birth to three. So I highlighted those here too as some additional resources. I, I like to refer to these three agencies as the three O's because it helps me remember, but these are other agencies where you might seek support as family advocates. OSPI I've mentioned several times tonight is the guidance agency for Washington State and they do have a family liaison who works directly with families to support them in understanding their rights and the different processes. Um, I believe they'll be hiring a second family liaison soon. OEO is the Office of Educational Ombuds. It's part of the governor's office. They do some things that are similar to what PAVE does um, and some things that are unique because they're part of the governor's office, but they can also support families in their collaborations with the schools. And then Office for Civil Rights can help with questions related to that middle part of the pyramid where you're talking about equity and access. It's also a place that you can file civil rights complaints, of course. So this is a page on our website. This one's a little old, but um, our website always has a picture at the top and some uh, articles that are newer. But I wanna call out that we have a button called Learning in School, which is where articles about uh, IEP would land. Here's where Get Help lives on our website in the upper right-hand corner. That's where you would click if you wanted one-to-one -one technical assistance. You can also search for information and articles in a topic that you want more information about. So you can just type keywords and then push the search bar and maybe come up with what you're looking for. You can also reach out by phone. We do have an 800 number, 800 572-7368. Um, you can either call that number or click 
the Get Help if you want that one-to-one -one technical assistance. If you call the toll-free number, you will probably be leaving a message. So be prepared with your name and your phone number and maybe even your email address so that we can call you back and check in with what is it, whatever it is that you have questions about and refer you to the appropriate staff. We do have some Facebook pages. Um, the one that I post to the most frequently is Parent Training and Information of Washington, and that goes statewide to share out information about special education process and all kinds of interesting things that are relevant in this work as family advocates. If you're a total uh, totally into like where the regulations live. These are the fancy numbers at the federal and state level where uh, the regulations of student and family rights live. And I do need to remind everyone that we are not a legal service agency. PAVE cannot provide legal advice and we cannot advocate for families or legally represent anyone in a process. So I thank you so much. That's the end of my presentation. I'm gonna stop sharing and Diet can stop the recording and then maybe we can go into gallery mode and I'd be happy to address your questions. You're on mute. Thank you. Okay, so Jerry's okay, so I'm going to stop the recording.